Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. It is my honor to present to you our speaker this evening, Dr. Bunyor, or Gina Bunyor. She is the acting dean of the College of Education in Siliman University, and she recently earned the degree PhD in education with specialization in reading education at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, Quezon City. She completed a Master of Arts major in English as a second language as a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Second Language Studies Department. She also has a Master in, in Education degree major in Teaching English as a Second Language at the University of the Philippines. She completed a certificate program in Professional Studies in Teacher Education at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia as a Fellow of PA Probe. She is a former consultant for the USAID-funded literacy instruction program called BASA Pilipinas, and recently the USAID-funded project ABC+, Plus, which is a program aimed at improving basic education outcomes in literacy, numeracy, and socio-emotional learning from early childhood education through grade three in selected regions in the Philippines. Professor Bonior's teaching experience ranges from being a junior high school language arts teacher at Siliman University High School, a graduate professor, a graduate school professor at Siliman University's MA TESOL program, and EFL instruct, instructor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's English Language Institute, and a volunteer reading teacher and storyteller of children in a small fishing village, which she told me is what makes her most enjoyable, enjoy, uh, enjoyable during uh, summer breaks. Professor Bunyor is a published writer and has presented her researches in national and international conferences, the latest of which was at the University of Sussex in United Kingdom, where she presented a paper on teachers at the forefront of reforms, focusing on teacher emotion in the enactment of education reforms in the Philippines. The paper won a bursary award that covered all conference-related expenses during the British Educational Researchers Association Annual Convention. Professor Bunyor completed her bachelor in secondary education, major in English minor in journalism at Siliman University, cum laude, and was awarded outstanding sophomore, junior, and senior student of Siliman University. Professor Gina Bunyor is married to Mario Bunyor, with whom she has a daughter, Danielle Marie, whom she fondly calls Bon Bon. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our emerging scholar in ethnography, Dr. Gina F. Bunyor. Well, thank you very much, Card, for that generous introduction. Um, it says here that I cannot yet share my screen. May I do so now? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Card. I would, Carty is a good friend of mine because we lived in the same dormitory at the University of the Philippines for a while. Okay, it looks like, I'm sorry, it looks like my screen is, my PowerPoint is still in the last page when I was reviewing this earlier. Okay, we're here now. And I'm now shifting to full screen. So, maayong hapon ka na tanan. As Carty said, you may call me Gina. And this afternoon, I thank Akra for the opportunity given to me to engage in a conversation about a recently concluded study that I did as a student at the University of the Philippines. I just completed my uh, PhD, and this study that I'm presenting was my dissertation project. So I am, I would like to acknowledge at the onset the contribution of my advisors, Dr. Romelin Metila and Dr. Yoprasho Abaya, who guided me through the conceptualization 
of the study. Uh, Dr. Abaya also was very patient with me in the debriefing session. And I also would like to acknowledge the multi-grade teachers in two remote islands in Central Philippines who accommodated me in their inner spaces and who were very patient with me, especially in the members checking of data. So you might be wondering about the title. So I was thinking maybe first, I will define the terms in the title. Hold on just a minute. So the title is Mediation and Appropriation of a Literacy Instruction Program in Remote Islands in the Philippines. So there are terms there that I want to make clear first in the context of how these are used in the study. Mediation here refers to contextualized factors or elements. I took that from Rogers and Scott in 2008 that influence decision-making and action as teachers interpret or reinterpret the program, especially in the context of top-down uh, policy. Appropriation here refers to the creative interpretive or creative interpretations of teachers as they engage with education. With sharing my screen again. Yes, please. Yes, please. All right, thank you. All right. So I know, ma'am, if my screen is already yes, visible. Looks fine. All right. All right. Thank you very thank much. You. So what is the context of this study? Um, in 2012-2013, the Philippines embarked on the uh, the basic education that we moved from a 10-year pre-university basic education program to a 12-year. So from grade one to grade 10, we moved, we shifted kindergarten to grade 12. And in relation to that, the country, the Department of Education also implemented mother tongue-based multilingual education. Um, the because of this initiative, there were lots of externally funded projects that supported the Philippine government's thrust in improving mother tongue based multilingual education, particularly in kindergarten to grade three. Because in this K 12 MTB MLA program, the mother tongue is to be used as the language of instruction from kindergarten to grade three. So I would like to start with my professionality. Why did I get interested in this? What was my motivation? What did I do? What did I hope to accomplish by what I did? What did I find out? And how does this relate to me as a practitioner, to the Department of Education, and even the Commission on Higher Education, which is in charge of training our literacy teachers? So I presented this in terms of my motivation and my motive. My motivation is that I was really interested as to whether this program, Mother Tongue Based Multilingual Education Program, focusing on literacy instruction worked because I was a consultant of that project. It was my first consultancy. I, this was my, also my first ethnography, by the way. So I am a novice ethnographer. I'm interested in qualitative research because of the classes I attended at the University of the Philippines. And my motive was that initially I thought I'm going to do this. I can gain entry into the site. This would be great for my graduate research. However, deep within me, I had this inherent desire to contribute even just so little to the development of literacy instruction in the Philippines. Um, this program, MPB MLA LIP, is a flagship basic education program of the country. And by flagship, it's because it's a very costly program. So I'm going to sort of give you the context. The coverage of this program is that it provided, it reached 1.8 million students from kindergarten to grade three. It trained 19,000 teachers and school heads, provided over 10 million units of teaching learning materials to 3,000 public elementary schools in the Philippines. So it's a very, in terms of coverage, 
even if they're only focusing on two regions, it spans teacher training, material preparation, and also support from administrators. In terms of the concept of this program, like I mentioned earlier, it presents itself as a holistic program because not only does it train teachers, it actually provides the materials, the big books, the learning guides, the level readers to the teachers, and also provide the necessary digital equipment, particularly for administrators. So administrators were given tablets and they were trained how to use the program to monitor teachers who were engaged in this literacy program. So in terms of the cost, understandably, the program was estimated to cost about 1.9 billion pesos in five years. And uh, the cost analysis of an external monitoring agency um, said that the program was estimated at $22.1 million, benefited 1.1 million grade one to grade three readers and students over four years. So as you can see, uh, it, this is why it's called flagship program. It was the, the most uh, well-funded program in its time. In terms of the context, I was, I was interested in this program because I am one of the, I was one of the consultants. I was engaged in teaching teacher training and I was assigned to clusters because we were asked to choose. So I chose clusters that spoke my language, which is in Obuano, Binisaya. And because of this, I had established relationships, uh, sh I should say deeper relationships with many of these participants. I should also say that many of the clusters assigned to me composed of teachers from remote islands, multi-grade teachers from remote islands who constantly message me about the difficulty of enacting the program given the circumstances and limitations and constraints that they were in. And this motivated me to look at how the program was interpreted and enacted or appropriated by teachers given this limitation. So the last thing that I place there is my connection to the teachers, which I've already explained. So the program is a very simple, straightforward theory of change. It believes that if you train teachers on effective literacy instruction practices, this is the balanced approach, approach to literacy and gradual release of responsibility. And if our schools have more books and high quality materials, that's why the program provided big books, level readers, so many other materials. And that these practices are supported by strong management system. That's why there was a leadership component support to the program. Then the conclusion is early grade students in the Philippines will acquire better reading skills in the mother tongue Filipino and English, which is from grade one to grade three. So I was thinking to myself, is the enactment of the program really this straightforward? Given that according to many studies, teachers exercise their agency and given constraints or limitations, teachers would reinterpret the program. So my purpose here is to investigate how this literacy instruction program was appropriated by multi-grade schools in two remote islands. The goal of which is hopefully I could design a model that will serve as a kind of a heuristic device for other researchers who would like to explore this area of research. Why did I choose this group? Like I said, my engagement with the teachers inspired me, motivated me to conduct this study. Secondly, there were many remote island teachers there. I chose these two particular islands because of the relationship that I have established also with the uh, administrators in the island. So I was thinking of how I could gain entry into the Department of Education. These islands are remote. And by remote, I mean I traveled every time I go to the capital city. So from Manila, I fly to the capital city. From the capital city to the end of the island, it's about 130 kilometers. And from that end, I take a boat, uh, like a small motorized boat, 
to this other island, other tip of the other island, and then take a habal habal ride. It's like a motorcycle, single motorcycle, go to the other end of the island, and from there, take another boat to these smaller islands. Why did I uh, take the pains to do that? There was no study that I've seen in the Philippines that looked at teacher appropriation of government or non-government funded initiatives and literacy instruction that focused on remote island schools, which are often, if not always, multi-grade because there are few students there, the island is so small, and since they are so far away from the Department of Education central offices or district offices, there are a lot of constraints that teachers need to negotiate with as they navigate through the program implementation process. So uh, while I was doing this, my advisor said, um, if you're going to do grounded research and ethnography, do very little literature review because you don't want any a priori assumptions. You don't want to bring in whatever uh, categories other researchers have already done. But I was a new, I was a novice researcher. So I was, I convinced my panel to allow me to go that a bit of research to inform me to like give me an idea of what others have done and this is what i saw in the literature and i'll mention here also the gap that i saw one i saw that in the implementation of education reform social context matters and yet there was in my research one or two only in the whole country that looked at social structures that looked at context or the contextualization of programs and what influences these have, right? Second, I noticed that in the studies, the place matters. So this is about contextualization. But there was no study in my review of literature in the Philippines that focus on remote island schools, that focus on multi-grade schools implementing literacy instruction programs. And to me, this is really uh, kind of sad because 30% of the schools in the Philippines are multi-grade. And there are 12,000, according to the data in 2012, almost 12,500 of these schools, right? And many of them in remote areas. So why is it that many of these studies are just in the cities or you know, easily accessible areas? I thought there is a need for us to look into uh, this sort of rarely studied, understandably because of the inconvenience it will bring uh, the researcher. Also, I noticed in the studies, teacher agency matters. So I was looking at, OK, what is teacher agency and how can we learn about it? So on the basis of this uh, quick review of the literature, I came up with these three questions. One, what mediation affect the appropriation of the program, particularly in multi-grade schools, specifically located in remote islands? And second, how do these teachers appropriate or creatively interpret and enact the program given these mediations? And finally, what are the consequences of these appropriations in relation to program goals and objectives? So this was sort of the framework that I initially did. I read well, from the work of Biesta Robinson um, that you know, this concept of teacher agents, right? That the teacher continually engages in an appraisal of available material resources, social resources, right? As they make decisions in implementing or enacting the program. And the teacher decision is actually influenced by other stakeholders, the parents, the, the teachers, the leadership of the school, and what they call program signal. By program signal, we mean how the program is presented to the teacher. For example, uh, the content, pedagogical, and the conditional features of the program. So this was the framework on teacher agency that I looked at. Uh, by Robinson, um, Yesta, and Gertz, I think. And this framework says that teacher agency or teacher's ability to exercise their agency in program implementation, so education reform implementation, 
is the result of the interaction between among iterational, practical, evaluative, and the projective. In other words, when I, as a teacher, uh, makes decisions in terms of program implementation, I, my decisions are influenced by my own history, personal history, professional history. Okay? And it's also influenced by my constant consideration or appraisal of my values, you know, the relationships, the roles, the politics, in other words, and also material resources. And this is important, material resources, because I was looking at remote island communities where resources do not often reach them as they need it. And the third is the projective um, dimension, which is when a teacher makes a decision, she will think about, you know, so what is in it for me? How does that relate to my short-term and long-term plan or goals? So having that as the sort of a broad background or conceptual theoretical background, I thought of uh, this as uh, my research design. I was interested first in doing phenomenology, you know, the lived experience of one teacher. But my professor, Dr. Abaya, who is an anthropologist said, uh, you might want to look at the bigger picture. So why don't you uh, try doing ethnography? So I read and, uh, and I am looking and presenting here uh, features of ethnography as presented by Michael Angostino. It's field-based. So that means you have to go there, live there. It is usually longitudinal. In my case, I stayed there for three months. So I lived with teachers uh, in two, two weeks in one area, more than a month in another. It is personalized. It is multifactorial because you're there. There is just so much to look at that sometimes it can get overwhelming. I'm sorry for the side comments, but I am telling the story of my own first ethnography. In, in some ways. And I was thinking, well, it may be good to look at grounded theory because what I got interested in grounded theory is you the, the theory that you hope to surface or to generate comes from the ground, meaning this comes from constant comparison until emerging categories surface. And based on recurrent themes, you look at relationships and see how they make sense in relation to your research question and devise either a model or a theory. And I thought, hmm, that would be interesting. So with having this as my background, now I have a little bit of my conceptual and theoretical framework, and I was, I was already quite sure of my research design. I went to the island. This is how it looks. So this is the big island that you see here. The, de the depth office is right here the far end of the island. And I was studying that island there. So I had to travel from this end to that tip of the island. And then I crossed to this island. There were two schools there that I was observing. I lived here for a, more than a month. And then from here, I crossed to this small island, population 200. Uh, it was more, it's about 1.8 kilometers, the whole island. So uh, it has its challenges. But I chose it because of this concept of critical instance. It is a sampling rationale that says go for least studied locale when if you feel that it is important to look at a phenomenon. So the data here that are not often studied and they are strategically bound to the argument at hand. So this are the, this is just, I'm using codes here. So you have there the district, and the district has several schools. I chose two schools, this in two different islands. So in Islam Dako, or the bigger school, there were two schools that I observed, and in each school, I observed two teachers. And in Islam Gamay, this is the one with uh, around 200 um, residents. I looked at also two teachers. Okay. So these are my participants. I was a participant observer. Uh, my, my engagement was what they call moderate participant observation. I, my role was I, 
I did what the community did. So if there was a community baile in the small island, they have that once a month, I'd go to the baile because that's how I can meet with parents and ask them informally, you know, when can I have like an interview or focus group discussion with them. And most of the time, every Monday to Friday, I go to the classes and I act as like teacher assistant. Uh, but most of the time I was collecting data. I only did something if the teacher says during example lunch break, if, if you could like tutor students. So this was my um, sort of schedule. And that's the island. That's me in the preliminary visit. So we did a visit like a, almost a year beforehand because I wanted to have a feel for the two islands. Be, and introduce myself to local government units like barangay captains and all that and introduce do some uh, they call it courtesy visit to the principal district heads etc so this is the the, the, the sort of framework um, it was primarily qualitative but since I had I looked at the data on oral reading verification tests from the district. So there was a bit of percentages, etc. So it was descriptive that only. And as I mentioned already, the theoretical uh, orientation I had is on teacher agency, teacher in motion, practice theory of Ortner. And my goal was to come up with a model. So very quickly, this was how I did it. Initially, I did some open coding so when we say open coding, uh, what you do here is you get the data and you try to um, come up with headings, right? So uh, I know you cannot read that. I, am, I just showed that uh, to tell just a brief look for those of you who are like me, first time uh, doing ethnography. Um, in open coding, you systematically engage in breaking down of data, examining, comparing, conceptualizing, and more importantly, categorizing the data. Once the data is categorized, you can proceed to focus or they call it actual coding. So in actual coding, uh, I think very important here is you reduce and reorganize the data. And now you start looking for recurrent themes or dominant themes. Uh, some ethical considerations, it's very important, informed consent. Now, I notice when parents in the islands, they, they fear signing any document. They have a negative attitude with signing anything because of some negative experiences in the past. So this was done early. I recorded it using my cell phone. I did not use any external recorder because I was thinking uh, they might feel anxious okay I, I see i have nine minutes remaining so the point in ethical consideration is do no harm okay this is how i uh, ensure credi credibility you know triangulation member checking or respondent validation debriefing and so on so eight minutes for finding um rq1 mediation this is what i found out teacher agency is influenced by spatial, geographical mediations, institutional, social, learner-mediated mediations, and programmatic mediations. I will not go in individually to all of this, but maybe just a few. Okay, this one. Um, there were five conditions related to program rollout that, teach, that inspired teachers. And the teachers felt that they were really part of the program because this was, they said, the first program that acknowledged their um, role that acknowledged their big role in the program in that they were billeted in really nice hotels the accommodation the trainers were brought in from manila uh, which is opposite to what they experience with deaf ed which is usually cascading or what they call echoing and they said so much is lost in translation when you have echoing of training so they they appreciated that the program brought in trainers from universities, for example. Okay, so this one very important, I think very interesting, mediations that are institutional. The concept of white papel, or I have no paper. So the school in charge, leadership is important in implementing any program. What I found out is that in these schools, the school in charge are actually not paid as administrators. They are paid as teachers, but they work as administrators 
on top of their teaching load. And considering that they are multi-grade teachers, one teacher was teaching kindergarten and grade one, and the other was teaching three and four, and also the school in charge, it is really very difficult for them. And the principal was missing because the principal is principal of two islands, principal of three schools. And sometimes it's very difficult for the principal to go from one island to another because of, you know, rough seas. And also because at that point, uh, she did not, she said she was not given transportation allowance, which I later on learned that uh, eventually uh, the schools were provided transportation allowance, especially for supervisors. Mediations that are spatial geographical. So monitoring from officially designated leadership was infrequent because of the remoteness of the school. So mechanisms for teachers to meet, to engage in these courses relevant to the program, such as learning action sessions, were also not sustained. And literacy materials were not readily available. In terms of RQ2, forms of appropriation. After this card, I can and and maybe for consequences they can just read uh, later on or ask during the the open forum but in terms of rq2 what are the forms of appropriation or how did the teacher interpret and uh, implement or enact the program given these constraints um, from the literature you see bricolaging that means they mix materials they look at which material goes with what they are already used to Hybridizing is teachers looking at what works and what doesn't, and they only pick what they feel uh, works, right? And then suspending this is very interesting. I learned that the first year of implementation, they really did not implement the program because they did not feel um, confident, and many of the materials did not arrive on time. And this, I'd like to share this concept, jama jama, uh, which means just make whatever it is that you can make. Uh, this is what they call an in vivo category. It's a category that came out not from the literature, but from the data itself. The teachers were saying, ah, you just mugna. Mugna means create. Just put together what you feel works. You don't have to follow the guide. You don't have to use the materials all the time. But what I noticed is that there is a very strong agency of materials, especially the big books. Even in the absence of teachers, children will mull around, they will mill around the big books and they will read stories to each other. So I was thinking that more than anything, well, I think it, very importantly that the agency, material agency or materiality, the, the agency of big books. Because I've noticed many times teachers are out because they're attending meetings in another island. Teachers will just leave the big books and children end up teaching each other, which I thought was wonderful. Most of the time I was left as like kind of babysitter. So I got to observe this. So here it is. That is the theory of change that was presented earlier. This is the model that I came up with after looking at con contextual elements and looking at how teachers renegotiated or co-constructed the program because they believe that this is what works given the resources that they have. Thank you very much. I think I have gone past my time. Thank you, Karti, for reminding me of the time. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gina. How I wished we had more time, but I believe we can have uh, some more discussions during the question and answer. So I now give the time to our facilitators, Dr. Pavel and Dr. David, and our panelists for uh, this presentation is Dr. Menin Pearl Caballero Talibong. She is a graduate also of Silliman University, and she's now teaching at Mountain View College. Uh, Love, you can start now your questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Gina, for the well-explained, insightful research. And we can really feel your passion and love for lit literacy programs and your big heart in helping our teachers in remote areas have their voices heard. 
So I'd like just to ask a question and then some follow-up questions after that. So my question is your research design used ethnography and grounded theory and a blend of those two. So my question is at which aspect or stage in your research did you use ethnography and grounded theory or did you use both methods at the same time throughout your research? And uh, yeah, so those are uh, the follow-up questions. And another uh, related to this is how often are these two used together in language education research? Okay, thank you very much, love. Very interesting question. Right, so I researched on it and I noticed there was very little uh, in language education research in the Philippines that combined ethnography and grounded theory. In fact, I did not see any, but I say very little because I was not able to read everything. So there probably are, but from my readings, none. Second is at which part of the research did I use ethnography, grounded theory? My advisor is an anthropologist. So he was really into ethnography, prolonged engagement, you know, uh, participant observation. And from the studies, I was convinced that this is the way to go. You have to immerse yourself as a participant observer and have really detailed field notes uh, in relation to your RQ. But I was interested in Sharma's uh, lack grounded theory, which says that the problem with some researches is that they go to the field with already predetermined categories. And I was partly doing that. You see, I had been nesting, hybridizing, bricologic. Mm -hmm. Those were all established in the literature. But because of my orientation in, in grounded theory, I had an in vivo category there, which is jama jama. You know, if I was not conscious about, there could be other categories if you just look at it. And don't look at it according your, to your predetermined category. So in that way, it helped me. But it's not that, okay, at this point, ethnography. It's at this point, grounded theory. Grounded theory was meshed, incorporated into ethnography as my main mm -hmm. research approach. Thank you. So you came up with the term grounded ethnography, or is that is that already? A, no, that's not for me. Yeah, I read about it in the literature. Somebody did it. It was on libraries, rolling libraries, and she combined ethnography, ethnography and grounded theory. Okay, thank you. Uh, how many have... qu questions can I ask? <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's okay. Uh, we give that time to others. Yes. Uh, maybe we can answer these two questions. If there are more questions, then we continue answering. But if not, we can go back to love. Right? Dr. Okay, Pagel. sure. sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, there are two questions from our participants. And uh, uh, one of these is, uh, how did you manage sustaining the participants' interest in the project. Okay, very interesting. In fact, you know, they were glad that I was there. They would always tell me, please tell them, mom, tell them up there that this is what we're going through. So um, I was, it also deepened my commitment because when I lived with them, I saw all these negative comments about teachers not doing and this and that. If you really live with a teacher, you know, in these very small communities, they live their families. They're there like missionaries, right? They build the schools because it's a very small school. And um, this one teacher that really moved me, inspired me, stayed there. When I was there, she was already on her fifth year. She literally set up the school. She built the school. And the first time, she was the only teacher. She was a multi-grade teacher teaching grade one to grade three. And she was the school in charge. She was the librarian. And then she was the, the, the community or the barangay head in the education committee. So every time there is a meeting in the local government unit, she was there representing the school, talking about health, taking care of, making sure the children's nutrition is well looked into and representing the school in the municipality for health projects. These are things that I thought, Wow, this is really 
beyond the scope of her job, but she does it because there was no one else in that small island who does it. So in terms of how I, I sustain it, it's more of me. It's actually the ethnographer who might have a hard time because you are also uprooted from your like University of the Philippines in Manila, and then you go to this small island, it's the ethnographer, I think, who will have a harder time sustaining it. In my case, I was blessed because the teachers continually inspired me. Every day was some a day that I look forward to because of what I see and the inspiration I get from the teachers. Thank you so much. We have a couple more questions here. Um, uh, the question from, uh, uh, from uh, Simon uh, Toribio, Toribio, how long should an ethnography, uh, which is basically field-based observation, be done? And I, can, uh, I want to, to join to that uh, question uh, and to ask about observation, because I think this is one of the key instruments of, of ethnography. Uh, how did you use that uh, in the, an obstructive way to to get this, uh, you know, important, valuable data, and how long did it take? Mm -hmm. All right. So, very interesting question. I'll answer the first question first. How long? Because yes. they say prolonged engagement is a characteristic of ethnography. So, I look according to Angosino. There is no specific timeline, but what you wait is when recurrent patterns or themes start to surface. So you see recurring answers in the FGD, you see in your field notes recurring themes, then that's a good indicator, right? That in my case, I stayed there for three months because that's the whole grading period, the one grading period that I wanted to look at. But according to the literature, there is no, some people stay for five years, 10 years in and, and anthropology and sociology studies. But the indicator is you look at constantly do constant comparison of data so you can see if there are already emerging themes and then the second yes. question was i'm sorry i missed that what it was about observation um how to how did you do that in uh, an obstructive way so it oh, could... all right mm -hmm. okay I like emic ethic perspective, and this is something that I always noted on in my reflective journal. Is it, is this, am I writing this because now I have this close relationship with the teachers because I am inspired by these teachers? How can I step back? So what I do is I call my advisor, Dr. Abaya, who's an anthropologist, for a debriefing session. So I cry to him and I tell him, sir, I want to go home. I really miss my family, but I need to do this. At the same time, these are opportunities for me to tell him, am I doing this right? Am I? And then he'd say, go back to your journals. Look at your journals and let your journals speak to you. That's why it's called reflexive. And then go to your data. So it helped that I had an advisor who was there <laughs> when I need him. And it's good that well, in one island, there was, there was good uh, connection. In the other island, you have to go to one rock. And that's the only place where you get uh, connection. And that's where I would call my advice. That's a good experience. Yes. Thank you so much <clears throat> for sharing that. I think uh, uh, if we can allow Dr. Talibong to ask one more question, and then we go back to the participants' questions. Mm -hmm. good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pavel. Um, one question I would like to ask is uh, the writing of memos. Uh, so uh, some researchers say, some scholars say that the writing of memos is way more important than coding in grounded theory. So to mom Gina, Dr. Gina, were there any moments of impressive discoveries and enlightening insights while you were writing memos? Yes particularly this concept of image ethic perspective. How do you, uh, my advisor would always tell me, Gina, there is no thing, such thing as objectivity in research. Research is situated, it's always located and you are positioned, remember that. You have your subjective reality. What you need to know now is go back to your memos, go back to your reflective journals and be transparent when you write about this. So every time you make an interpretation, look at your memo and think, reflect 
of why and how you did that. And also, I think I should mention member checking. Because I was living with the teachers, it was easy for me at the end of the day. So I tell them, you know, this is what I observe. And, and I think it's because of this. What do you think? Member checking is um, important. Uh, in addition to doing our respective journals and our memos or notes to sell. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to, to read one comment from our participants. Um, from Gail Parker, um, um, the, it, it, it reads uh, like this. She was uh, she, uh, the, uh, there was a hand raise, but there was no time to, to go back and to, to do this technicality. So I will just read it. Uh, I just want to commend uh, the uh, PhD candidate for the, for the passion that she shows for the topic she researched. It is evident that she really immersed herself. Well done. So I think many will uh, join to that comment. Um, we have a few questions uh, here, and I'm not sure if we can have time for all of them. Um, maybe we will um, ask uh, Dr. Gina to stay by and to try to answer those questions, some of them who would, will not be covered orally. Um, but still, uh, one question uh, that was frequently asked, uh, how were you able to minimize the effects of researchers' bias throughout the study? Mm. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, the memos, the reflective journals, and the briefing sessions with my advisor helped a lot because there were instances when I was already too involved. And so my advisor said, stay away. Get out of the island for a while. This is the small island because that was the really most uh, compelling for me because just of the difficulties that, uh, that, that I experienced together with the teachers. And I'm not only talking about difficulties in the classroom, just like not having water because we only have rainwater. We don't rely on that. So you have to make sure that you know when you take a bath, just this small pail of water, all this. So my advisor said, because I was already crying on the phone more than once, he said, you need to detach yourself for a while. So I left the island and I came home to my family. And then after a week, I went there with renewed excitement and interest. So that helps too. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is now our next, for our next uh, presenter. We welcome uh, Dr. Theodore Duxbury. Okay, so uh, Theodore is a former part-time lecturer in pharmacy practice at Rhodes University. He is a published PhD candidate in pharmacy practice with a project titled Building Resilience Through Community-Driven Rural Health Development and Asset-Based Epistemic Just Systems Analysis Approach done in collaboration with a community engagement, epistemic justice, engaged research center at Rhodes University. He is supported by the 2018-2020 National Research Foundation Southern African Systems Analysis Center Doctoral Scholarship. He graduated from Rhodes University with a bachelor in pharmacy in 2016 and his master in pharmacy in 2018. His thesis is titled Collaborative Health Literacy Development, a World Health Organization Workplace Health Promotion Approach to Address Tobacco Use. Mr. Duxbury obtained an additional higher certificate in healthcare services management as cum laude from Regent Business School in 2019. His work earned him the prestigious Investic Rhodes Top 100 Student Leadership Award in 2019. His academic achievements allowed for him to be invited to be a member of the Golden Key International Honorary Society in 2019. His work addresses health and social inequalities and facilitates health development through leadership, strengthening and epistemic justice at Rhodes University and in the Graham, Grahamstown community. These activities include workplace health promotion projects, national science festival exhibitions, student volunteering, National Science Week workshops and student mentorship. The outcomes of these activities could be viewed at, on his personal website and you can visit this one. Ladies and gentlemen, kindly welcome uh, 
Theodore Duxbury in his presentation, Understanding Critical Concepts in Engaged Research, the case of a rural health development project in South Africa. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Can everyone hear me? It's all good? Yes, yes. Okay, so good day to the ACRA organizers, to all the members, the panelists, viewers, and listeners, and to all those, um, I see some familiar faces that I've seen at the, uh, the conference last year in Portugal. It's really lovely to see you all. So as has been stated, I'm Theodore Lander Duxbury from the Rhodes University Faculty of Pharmacy, as well as the Rhodes University Community Engagement uh, Department, specifically the Engaged Research and Epistemic Justice Group. And so my area of research focus over the years have been um, health development, specifically in marginalized and underserved communities. And so this is the basis for today's presentation and uh, where I would like to recommend and shine light on the various engaged research concepts that we can use um, to promote health, uh, prevent disease, uh, and, and run research development projects um, within marginalized vulnerable communities. Um, also those with compromised um, literacy and health literacy backgrounds. And so then I will use my doctoral research as well as uh, my, my publications as examples. Kindly bear in mind that um, COVID-19 stuck um, halfway through this project. And so the implementation phase is not fully completed yet. Um, so, but I will present to you what I have this far. And so this is the publication that forms the basis of the, um, the theoretical framework uh, and literature review background of this project. Um, it's been published in the Qualitative Research and Practice, Practices and Challenges publication, New Trends in Qualitative Research. And I've done so with my supervisors as well as collaborators, Dr. Charlie Ann Peters, Dr. Joanna Bezera and Professor Roman Tandlik. Um, and it's entitled Understanding Critical Concepts in Engaged Research, um, the case of a rural health development project within South Africa. And then we would also just like to, to thank all the sponsors, um, the Southern African Systems Analysis Center for doing capacity development, as well as the National Research Foundation for funding the research as well as providing scholarships to the researchers and then the university and all the different organizations. And so the aim of this research project was to improve community well-being and build health resilience um, through, let me just move my camera, through, let me just, sorry, through community-driven development, utilizing a participatory, asset-based systems analysis and epistemically just approach. Now to some, these might be very um, complex terms, but um, we'll break them down throughout the presentation and a more um, elaborative um, discussions and um, written material can be found within the publication. And so through this study, we've been able to mobilize community members to share, analyze and enhance their health knowledge and practices. And we've done so purely through facilitating health empowerment in a dem democratic participation um, in the social justice framework. And so I'll take you through this process um, in the presentation. So we'll go through the context for the research as well as the setting research problem, theoretical framework, research questions and objectives, the method and results, as well as the discussion and conclusion. So the research search setting is within Makanda, uh, previously known as Grahamstown within South Africa. And it's a small town, an academic town, um, and the research has been done in rural um, game reserve villages between the Port Elizabeth um, area as well and, and the Grahamstown area. So here you can see the context in which the study was based. It was conducted in communities facing major socioeconomic challenges um, they are far away from urban centers, some up to 60 kilometers or more. 
Um, they live in informal settlements, inadequate access to healthcare, nutritious food resources, and all the various other types of resources. And it really gives you the background to the effects of South Africa's history, as well as it, the political climate pre-1994. And it is still evident today. And so this project was really designed to be sensitive to these, to these type of conditions. And that's, for, that's why we use the epistemic justice approach to this whole um, project. And so socioeconomic and um, healthcare challenges and inequalities within South Africa um, remain robust against the restorative efforts of the post-apartheid government within South Africa. And these are things such as inadequate health coverage to rural areas, which results in reduced access to healthcare, particularly within the Eastern Cape, which is the second to most poor province within South Africa. And despite increases in healthcare facilities in these remote rural areas, significant barriers to health, health development remain, some of which are um, affordability, travel costs, uh, mobility, quality of healthcare, amongst many others. And so it's further exacerbated by socioeconomic inequalities, um, and it adds to the further constrained um, Eastern Cape healthcare system um, through facilitating elevated child and maternal mortalities, communicable and non-communicable disease prevalence. And so as much as we try with medical interventions uh, to run health programs and to prevent disease and treat diseases, um, st structural as well as socioeconomic and cultural barriers to, to non-adherence to medical interventions remain. And these are factors such as lack of transport, food scarcity, lack of social support, inadequate medical and mental health care services, low health literacy, stigma, relationship with healthcare workers, amongst many other factors. And these are all factors which biomedical models alone cannot solve. Those factors are exacerbated by social injustices, such as poverty, which is, which we could say um, physical poverty in this instance, food, clean water and shelter, access to healthcare, education, racism, and the effects of apartheid. It's all argued to exacerbate a term called epistemic injustices. Now, th this term has been promoted by someone called, um, called, let me just get to her name now, Marinda Frika, to a, from in a publication in 2007. And she says that these injustices mostly occur when a person is insulted, or wronged in their capacity as a knower and by way of denouncing their humanity. And so epistemic injustices present itself during epistemic relations between marginalized social groups and the epistemically privileged counterparts. It's basically the influences that the powerful have on the powerless. And so this is really um, in line with the context within South Africa and its history and its political climate. And so therefore it's, it's really good to focus on um, being epistemically just. And so Miranda Frika, she, she, as we said uh, um, in her publication, um, it's the relationship between dominant and marginalized um, community members. And she divided them into two sections called testimonial and hermeneutical injustices. And so testimonial injustices occur um, when the hearer discounts the credibility of a person's testimony due to prejudice against their social identity. So that might be their race, their sex, their education, um, any of those types of factors. And an example of this might be within a healthcare setting, when a healthcare provider discounts a woman's testimony um, about her symptoms purely because she's a woman. And this is a, can be called a testimonial epistemic injustice. Secondly, hermeneutical injustices. These occur when an individual or social group lacks the interpretive resources to make sense of important features of a speaker's in, um, experience because that marginalized group has been prejudically excluded from the meaning making process, very prevalent within South Africa's context. And so an example of this might be when a marginalized group reports cultural reasons for non-adherence to a medical um, re regimen. The hearer from the dominant group may fail to understand the experiences of that group um, and the marginalized groups similarly 
might struggle to explain the experience in terms which can be easily understand the, uh, interpreted by the dominant hearer. And so this is the this is kind of the basis for the epistemic injustice aspect. And so we thought that it would be really um, useful if we focus on something called the um, theoretical framework uh, for uh, the transformative paradigm. And so the transformative paradigm is really useful within a context such as this and uh, doing research within this context because it is specifically orientated towards marginalized communities. And so Martin's 2009, and I'll quote this quickly to you, the trans open quotes, the transformative paradigm emerged in response to individuals who have been pushed to societal margins throughout history and who are finding a means to bring their voices into the world of research, close quote. And so it's really a useful framework in addressing inequality and injustice in society through using culturally competent mixed method strategies to address the complexity um, of culturally significant settings which could provide the basis for social change. And so here we can see there are a couple of philosophical beliefs, ontology, epistemology, axiology, methodology, and methods. And we focus specifically on the relativity ontology, where we acknowledge that truth is created by meanings and experiences. So we try to understand an individual's experiences um, and the context that shape it. And so for that to do that, the researcher must explore and interact with the participants in a participatory manner. Uh, and we have to recognize their social, political, and cultural realities. Next is the epistemology. We mostly focused on the emic epistemology. And so here it refers to the relationship again between the research and the research. And we acknowledge that knowledge is constructed from a participant's frame of reference. And so uh, the, the emic approach denotes the, the account of the insider's view of reality. This, it allows for the description of behavior, beliefs, and experiences from the participant's perspective. And then the uh, axiology is mostly um, the action and ethical values that is epistemic justice, as I've explained previously, the relationship that the powerful have over the powerless. And then the methodology, we focused on aspects such as community-based participatory research, um, uh, health promotion, which I discussed within the publication, um, but unfortunately not within this presentation because it is quite hefty. And then asset-based community development, as well as a systems thinking approach. And so these methods were really are collaborative and they give power and agency to the participants and it encourages them to transform society from status quo. It's a mixed methods um, uh, research where we do interviews, workshops, storytelling, observations, and those types of things. So first of all, let's look at the concept of systems analysis. And so systems analysis, I believe, is very important within engaged research because you go into a community um, wide, uh, with a wide angle view. Um, you don't go in with um, already a predetermined set of uh, um, ideas. So you really need to look at all the possible variables and how they play into interact with one another and then kind of focus in on that one prominent area. And so sister, this is the role that systems analysis played really well. So it's a process of studying an existing system and its influencing factors to determine how it functions and how it meets the needs of those within the system. And it allows the researchers to capture the complexities involved in persistent complex health and social problems. These problems comprise of a high level of interconnectedness and interdependence that linear chronological thinking alone cannot solve. And this is just an example of how the variables are related and, in, and, um, and interrelated to one another and in the end converted into quantitative data that we can then use and manipulate. The next aspect is asset-based community development. And so asset-based community development also is a very critical um, uh, concept to use within engaged research, especially within this context, because it shifts, especially uh, also within South Africa in its context, 
it shifts the uh, participant's mental space from I don't have and I can't and I'm not able to change my own circumstances. And it shifts their perception to a more positive way. So I, I can, I do have, and I'm going to do something about it, which is really important when we promote health within these spaces. So the asset we refer to here could be the value we have um, or what adds to our quality of life. Um, the, the base refers to where, the spaces in which we find ourselves and it's led by the communities towards a shared goal and vision. Development refers to growth, change and improvement. And so, as I said previously, it, 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 it surfaces hidden gifts, abilities, capabilities, and it's really it grows towards a shared vision. We focus on what is good, what is strong um, and what we can use to change our own circumstances. And so assets can be divided into five different categories. And so we can find human assets such as knowledge and health, social, which is social networks, um, natural, land, water, um, animals, financial, which can be cash, or savings, pensions, and, and physical assets, which can be roads and those different types of, of, of assets. And so it's really opening the participant's mind to look, I do have all these assets around me, and I can actually do something about the conditions and the spaces in which I find myself in. Because these, these uh, communities are far excluded from urban settings, and so they, they, they don't have the resources from, from the external um, aspect to kind of change their situations. And so this study focused on theories of systems thinking, epistemic justice, and it was conducted using a participatory action, action research, um, an asset-based approach to rural community development. It's a voluntary study with comp uh, consenting um, community members of four rural hard to reach game reserve villages outside Grahamstown with approximately 200 adults. So the inclusion exclusion criteria was very basic for this project. We, we just asked that people that work there, that they work there at least for a period of a year and participants that stay there to have at least stay there for a minimum of a year and be over the age of 18 years. The reason for this was so that they can, we, we know that when they do communicate with us and share their stories and experiences with us, that they kind of understand the concept of the context and the cultural um, dynamic and, uh, and, and social economic dynamic within those spaces. And um, yeah, and so the sampling techniques that we used here was snowball sampling, specifically for non-discriminative snowball sampling, as well as purpose of sampling, a homogeneous sampling. And these are just a few diagrams to show how we've done the sampling process. Um, which is kind of really useful when we're doing community entry within these spaces to kind of how you navigate and find your way through, through these spaces. And then the trustworthy criteria that I'm not going to go through, but I'm sure us as, as qualitative researchers are well familiar with. So these are credibility, transferability, dependability and confirmability. Data collection, um, so it started off with interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews that we would have with participants. And during our workshops, we would do concept mapping and I would do personal reflections in the form of field notes and observations. Um, and then we would process that data because the participants are Isikosa speaking participants. And so we need to, and I am, I am Afrikaans and English. And so the, uh, I needed a translator with me to translate uh, in, an interpreter with me and a translator to then translate the transcriptions as well. Uh, yeah, so that we needed that to process the data. And then NVivo and Vensum PLE, which kind of formed the software for um, systems analysis and, um, and then the thematic analysis that we've done. The data was then presented in graphs, maps, tables, figures, and graphics. And then we used the data again back into the research to inform the research process. I would then like to uh, it, reiterate that because of the background, socioeconomic background of these communities, um, most of them did not have the opportunity to go to school and they stay in very rural spaces. And so they get very easily intimidated with by pen, paper 
by reading uh, documents and then also speaking in languages that doesn't um, that is not appropriate to them and so we made um, a conscious effort to use color to use stickers and those types of methods to kind of engage with them it's a fully engaged project and we did not require any kind of um, writing, reading, um, any of those uh, uh, options within this project. It was very challenging, but fun at the same time. And so, as I said, interviews were done. They were then transcript, transcribed, analyzed with in vivo and systems analysis, as well as asset-based analysis uh, that we done after it and systems analysis. And then the process just continues through and through. Um, we used a voice recorder, as I said, field notes, Microsoft Word, and Vivo, then some software during this process. And then data analysis, as I've said, thematic analysis, systems analysis software, and then the trustworthiness that we've done, member checking, peer debriefing, triangulation that we've done throughout the process. And then I would just like to show you a quick um, excerpt of Envivo and how I use this to do a thematic analysis of all the transcripts that the, the participants have presented. And it has really allowed for me to assign humanity, if I can put it that way, to the written document uh, and the statement made. So I can say that it's a person, um, they are within this age group, they are male or female or other. Um, they occupy the occupation, so this individual works in grounds and gardens, they are a staff member, and, um, and they can have their place also. And so the class, case classifications and those types of items, it's nice to play with and it, can, it really helps with the analysis of the data, as you can see here. You can in the end, kind of, um, all the themes that came out, you can see, okay, maybe 33% of individuals within the age group, 51 to 60, um, spoke about um, uh, the word action, the word alcohol, the word assets, employment, family members are very important to them and those types of assets. So you can kind of, um, and Vivo is a really good tool to do data analysis and you can shift it to then see, okay, how many males said this or spoke about this word? How many females, uh, other occupation play, places? It, it's a nice, it's a nice program to play with. And then it also formed a really good basis for us to then um, roughly start with the systems analysis process. So Envivo allowed for us to now start linking the different nodes and themes that came out of the research project. So as I said, we did triangulation. Um, and then I would just like to show you um, how I've done member checking, which was very important for the credibility section of this uh, research, is we would have one meeting and then straight after the meeting, we would analyze and reflect on what we've done so that I as a, research, a researcher can make sure um, that I have understood them correctly and I'm analyzing them correctly and I can move forward and plan and kind of um, look forward to the next meeting uh, in an in appropriate man manner. And then when I come back to them for the second meeting, we would reflect again on the previous meeting. And so then I can kind of remind them and to now say, okay, have I, have I analyzed your data correctly? Do I understand you correctly? Can we, um, so kind of, it's a really fun process. And so it's just, to show you how I remember checking in that way. And so the research question was, um, what are the community health challenges and how are these challenges interrelated, the systems analysis aspect? How do community members perceive, uh, what do they perceive to be the source of their health challenges and how are they currently addressing it and what are the current tested um, body of health knowledge? Um, which is really that uh, epistemic justice aspect of giving a voice to the voiceless and the suppressed and marginalized. And then what can we do in a participatory way to then ch uh, combat health challenges? And so the research objectives was therefore to investigate these, these challenges and to perform a risk analysis, um, to use systems analysis approach to determine the factors contributing to their health challenges, and then to evaluate, comprehend, recognize, past and current indigenous health knowledge and practices. And then, as I said, to investigate participatory strategies that we can use um, to then combat those challenges. So during the first phase, this was mostly the community entry phase. And within this phase, we started off, um, it's quite important culturally to follow this process when you enter a village. And so you have to go first, if it's in a game reserve, you go to the managers, ask access to their premises, get their buy-in and kind of see how they understand the community members. 
And then you go to community members and you speak to them, you kind of find out how they are, what are their challenges, do they enjoy staying there, and kind of start pulling your variables um, together and building up on the social determinants of health. And then you go to community, uh, community leaders because community leaders are very important um, in the mobilization phase. And you cannot enter a community without having permission from community leaders to enter their villages and their spaces. And so it's important that they play their role. And then after that, we then kind of made, we had workshops all the way through, we had workshops um, where we then sat together, came together and discussed in safe and inclusive spaces about the health challenges that they have. So the, how we apply the asset-based community development aspect, as I've said, this was mostly step one was motivation. So to shift them from that aspect of, um, I've been pushed to societal margins, I don't have, I can't, um, I can't solve my own problems, I need people from the outside to come in and help me. And to, to, so that was basically just to eliminate, or kind of work as hard as we can to eliminate that aspect and to show, okay, we actually can, we are capable of doing it um, and we, we can do something about it. So that was the motivation step of the ABCD workshops. And then we went forward to see, okay, now we are motivated, we take ownership, let's see what assets we have and let's do an inventory to see, okay, um, what, do I, what do I have? So I'm going to show you a few charts later on, the hand and heart models, the asset trees and those types of things. I mean, how, what I, and what I kind of did to make them realize the good that are within these communities and how they can use them. Then vision and planning, how can we now use these assets to kind of change our current circumstances and, and mobilizing it and then leverage it with external entities so that um, we can have their inputs. There are 35 participants, male, female, ranging from all managers, staff and residents um, and, uh, and, and uh, regular visitors um, and mostly easy cross are speaking individuals which is a native language within South Africa. So coming to the results section of that first phase of, 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 of um, research, I referred to the villages as village one, village two, village three, village four, to, to uh, maintain confidentiality. So firstly, they identified that there was a shift in the community identity because culturally um, it's important for Isikosa individuals to have their own livestock, be involved with uh, agriculture and those types of things because they use it in negotiations, um, rituals, um, when it comes to marriage and those types of, uh, um, of, of, of rituals. And so when, it, when the game reserve individuals came in and said, now we're going to make this uh, a, 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 a wildlife park, these individuals now had to get rid of all of that. So, because they can't have chickens, they can't have cattle and those type of items. So they had to get rid of it. So they, there's a shift in their identity as human beings and um, within that space. And it's also very difficult mobility wise. The nearest town, Makandas, uh, Grangetown is 60 kilometers away. And these small villages are surrounded by wildlife. So they can't just go out because there are lions and tigers and all different types of things within those spaces. Um, and then health challenges. Um, they, so what government does is they send out mobile clinics to go out to rural areas. But uh, these clinics, when they arrive, they don't have, might not have the resources to look after all the needs um, of the community. And also they care, um, they, they don't come regularly. So for emergencies, um, someone might um, die from simple conditions which might which could have been treated because, but they don't have a transport to go to where they need to go um, as well as access to basic resources such as food water electricity health challenges such sanitation um, and then the diseases that they identified was hypertension was the primary con um, concern um, specifically alcohol use um, as a determinant um, HIV AIDS and diabetes and so um, this is what we've done within the, um, as I've shown you previously, the ballot system of the, the pictures with the, with the stickers where they say, okay, um, um, I gave them stickers um, as I've shown previously. And then I said, okay, hypertension, um, 
from our discussions, we found out that these were the prominent conditions within the society, so within the community. So let's vote. And so they had stickers for each color of a condition. So maybe diabetes was orange, HIV was yellow, alcohol was red. And so they placed stickers to say what is most prominent to them, what they want to focus on, what is the most pressing issue. And so therefore they kind of, um, they chose um, alcohol use, hypertension, um, and, and stress, which also most of them, I only, I only use two villages because um, for demonstration purposes. And so we decided to go with hypertension, but focus on its risk factors such as alcohol use and stress because it includes all of that. Um, and you can see a photo of the level of communities. <laughs> So these are the asset-based community development workshops, and these are the charts that I have used. Um, so it is in Isikosa because they speak Isikosa. Um, so we used models such as what are you good with with your hands, with your mind? What are your skills? What are your talents? What do you, what do you love doing? What are you really good at doing? So in our discussions, we would have this. I would write it down and I would place it on the boards. Um, we use asset trees to kind of say, okay, um, what, what challenges have you had in the past and what did you use to get over those challenges to kind of get them to understand what assets are, what assets mean. Um, and so um, we used pictures and charts and diagrams and those types of things, which, which they thoroughly enjoyed doing um, and which was fun for me also as a data collection method. So I didn't require them to fill in questionnaires or write down anything to me. Um, we did it in an engaged, a nice engaged way. And here are some pictures of us doing the workshops. So here you can see the chart. So everyone would have a blue sticker, a, a orange sticker, a yellow sticker, and they would kind of vote to see, okay, which conditions they have. So they didn't have to write. They didn't have to be intimidated by holding a pen in their hand and having to write and read. Um, there, I'm in one of the participants' homes, sticking up the boards, running workshops, using diagrams, using models to kind of explain, do um, hypertension workshops, education workshops, and those types of things. And then there are we doing concept mapping. Yeah, so to conclude as a discussion, um, develop community, um, it's important for us to develop community health through facilitating health empowerment in a de democratic participatory way and in a social justice framework. And in decolonizing knowledge systems is important within this context um, and to honor indigenous desert health systems and to enable community members to share, analyze and enhance their health knowledge and practice, really involve them in the research process. Um, and then to incorporate that into what we call explicit formal knowledge systems. Um, yeah, and so to conclude, this has been a really um, a fun project. And by analyzing community health variables through a systems thinking lens, synergizing epistemic justice, participatory health development, these, this adapts a very innovative methodological approach. And this indigenous decolonizing approach to health development incorporates the key indigenous principle, which states, don't plan about us without us. And so um, that concludes the end of my presentation. Those are my references. There's a short list of some of my publications. Um, and then I would like to thank all the key stakeholders. Thank you, Nkosi and Danki and Afrikaans for everything. Um, and there's a, a short um, clip of all my, um, my links. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Theodore. We sincerely appreciate uh, the hard work you did in this research. You have given us a good example of how to do this type of research. Our, I would like to introduce to you our panelist for today. She is Samridhi Sharma. She is a qualitative researcher and she has been involved in community engaged research for health promotion. She is a part of the Rhodes University COVID-19 science engagement team. Uh, Professor Sharma, please uh, uh, start now your, your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Theo, for your informative and interesting presentation. Your work you. adds tremendous value to the area of health development, particularly for underserved communities. So I have three main questions for you. Um, to start off with, how did an epistemically just approach help overcome the barrier of literacy with the given target group? Okay. Can I respond? Yes, go ahead, please. 
Okay, perfect. So as I said uh, previously, um, uh, epistemic justice allows for us to really be sensitive to the needs of the community. And, and, and as a country such as South Africa, with its highly divided political past um, and history, um, it, in the community members are already sensitive. Um, so, uh, so some of them didn't get a chance to go to school, some stay in deep rural areas and those types of things. And so epistemic justice really said, let's not judge any, anyone. Um, let's not exclude anyone from the process. As I've said um, in my examples, I didn't ask anyone to read or write anything because um, I would be discriminating against them if I forced them to write uh, and do, uh, to write using a piece of paper or read in English because they've been excluded from that process. Um, and so um, epistemic justice is really helpful in kind of getting um, um, past and being sensitive to those kind of contexts within South Africa, um, especially health literacy also. So it's a completely engaged project. We used uh, models, we used charts, demonstrations, those types of things to kind of boost health literacy within these areas um, in no offensive way. Thank you. <laughs> and knowing that the population is low resourced, how did your method ensure and enhance ownership, leadership, and sustainability of the project? So um, we use the method called um, asset-based community development. And so, as I said, the motivation part of that process played a very important role because um, for people to, to, uh, so, uh, to ensure a sustainable project, we have to make sure that people are motivated, they are engaged, and they take ownership of the project. And so asset-based community development really supports that because it, ident it, it, like, it relates to each and every person's individual circumstances, what they have, what they can't have. Um, and it, it, it kind of plays a big role in getting participants to become involved and take ownership of the project and recognize each of their backgrounds. And so um, that's kind of like um, the method that we used to kind of yeah, promote the sustainability of the project and be inclusive. And then lastly, how did you as a researcher and healthcare professional balance between epistemic objectification and epistemic shrinking? So basically between evidential stance and trusting stance yeah. when conducting your workshops. Yes. So us as healthcare professionals need to be very sure uh, not to uh, overstep any of these boundaries. Of epidemic, um, um, epistemic objectification um, refers to when a healthcare professional um, trusts the testimony um, um, too much without being credible um, and using, um, knowledge, um, using um, credible knowledge resources. And so, um, and then the objectification, uh, epistemic objectification is whether um, where the healthcare professional doesn't consider the testimony of the, of the patient at all. And so um, we really have to find the base, uh, the, the, the common ground between both. And within this research context, um, we kind of, uh, under the trustworthiness criteria, we kind of made sure to acknowledge the backgrounds and the stories and the testimonies of all the participants and kind of um, give credibility towards it by doing member checking, comparing all the different testimonies to one another to make sure that we are not blindingly just accepting any testimony that has been given. And so it's been, it's a challenge, but it's really good to find the balance between objectification and shrinking within the epistemic justice space. Okay. So we can move to, to the participants' questions. Thank you so much, Theodore, for this uh, uh, presentation. And uh, personally, I, I'm struggling to, to understand uh, is, uh, if your research is purely uh, qualitative or it's uh, like a mixed method. Um, I, I feel that, uh, you know, there is something more than uh, just qualitative when you, when you interviewed 35 uh, participants, it's, it's quite a uh, you know, high number. Um, the, and also you try to quantify uh, some of your data and uh, produce variables which already, you know, sounds uh, pretty much quantitative. Um, yeah. So and like so, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I used, um, as I've stated, I used kind of a mixed method approach. 
And so starting off with mostly qualitative data, um, and then through the systems analysis process, we um, you kind of uh, has has a, a um, it allows you a way to quantify those data, um, those data sources. I don't know if I'll be able to go back um, in my presentation to to that section, um, but you can see it, it it pushes out graphs and figures and those types of things. You quantify the relationships between the variables, and then also um, quantitatively um, analyzing to saying this percentage of individuals um, prefer this, they do this, they have this demographic background, those types of items. So those are kind of the minor qualitative, quantitative aspects of my study. And they kind of um, support one another in that way. So there are three questions from our participants. Um, uh, one of them is actually related to what I just asked. Uh, uh, how can a qualitative data be converted to a quantitative data? <laughs> So the, the participant is interested in how to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so let me just, um, I would have to share my screen again to show you my presentation, but as you, I, um, I'll show you again um, that um, using a, a Vensum um, systems analysis software, mm -hmm. you use different variables. So uh, as in, in this instance, I use the social determinants of health. And then you start to see how those aspects interact with one another and how they relate to one another. And in the end, um, you'll be able to see graphs, relationship graphs and diagrams and figures and, and those types of aspects that you can kind of use to manipulate and see um, how the variables respond and react to one another and how the system functions. Um, so yeah, that's the next kind of big so focus nice. of the project. Yes, there is another question from uh, Janet Espada. Uh, what uh, challenges did you encounter in contextualizing your community development program uh, as an offshoot of the study? Okay, so uh, contextualizing it was uh, very, uh, was actually very challenging because uh, first of all, I am, um, the, my participants are of a different background and culturally also than myself. So I needed to understand them first. And so um, I kind of, I didn't go all the way ethno ethnography in that sense, but I did spend a lot of time in the field. I didn't stay with them in that sense to kind of understand how they, how they function, how they do things, how the relationships work amongst the in individuals, maybe what conflict there is, how they solve their problems, those types of aspects. Um, and that kind of really helped me to, to see um, the, the communities that I work in. And then I went back to the literature to say, okay, and see um, how, how I can then contextualize and kind of present this in a way that the world would understand it. Um, yeah, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Pavel, yes. we, I'm sorry, we don't have okay. time anymore. Okay. 